Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga. Welcome to another Saturday presentation here with Heritage Mississauga as we seek new ways to connect and explore the rich history and, and uh, amazing stories connected with the city of Mississauga. Uh, today's presentation is called Shaping Mississauga, um, and uh, as a little bit of a, a note here, this is going to be a whirlwind tour, uh, kind of a, a chronological whirlwind tour of, the, of the, the story and the history of the city of Mississauga. Um, every one of the slides that we're going, to, we're going to touch on very briefly through this presentation can be a breakout presentation unto itself, and they are. Um, so when watching this, if there are things that you're interested in exploring further, uh, things you're curious about, let us know. And uh, this it can be uh, subjects for future presentations and future inquiries uh, uh, from, from us here at Heritage Mississauga. So uh, kind of sit back and enjoy, and uh, we're going to have a, a, a whirlwind tour through uh, the, uh, the history and the timeline of the city of Mississauga. As um, uh, a little bit of an introduction to this uh, program, uh, Shaping Mississauga, um, the, uh, the, the idea that uh, became this program um, did not originate from myself. Um, this came several years ago from, uh, the inspiration for it came several years ago uh, from a art exhibit we did here at the Grange with uh, grade 11 and 12 uh, art students from Arendelle uh, Secondary School, uh, led by teacher Ms. Sheena Curry. And uh, the subject of their, their uh, annual art show, the subject for that year's art show, and I think it was uh, 2014, I believe, uh, was, was entitled Shaping Mississauga. And the theme being uh, the students were challenged to create a uh, individual work of art for what they felt were uh, uh, significant moments that helped shape the city in which they lived. I didn't know what to expect. Um, we gave kind of a brief introduction to the story and the history of Mississauga, and then it was up to the students to kind of connect with the subject in, in many ways. Um, what I was absolutely amazed with was there were over 70 submissions to, uh, to the art show, um, and the vast breadth of the story in which the students individually connected with, all, all these different thoughts of what was important or what was significant in their eyes, the most significant thing in their eyes for the story of Mississauga. And so, uh, that art show, the concepts behind it, and, and the, the subjects explored by the students um, inspired the creation of this program um, and taking the title from the show for the program itself. Um, and I'm inspired by uh, the, the mindset of the students who created that artwork to, to know that uh, um, they engage with the, the, the subject of the story and you know, the place in which they live. Uh, in such a, a broad-mannered way. Um, in a little bit of uh, you know, a tongue-in-cheek comment, I was expecting, you know, 70 portraits perhaps of, of Hazel McCallion or, um, you know, different aspects of the, our, our stories, our city's development, but to, to have the breadth in which they engage with the subject, anything from Indigenous history right through to the Avarero and the train derailment and very little to do with the modern city in which they were currently living. And it was inspiring to see the young generation, the rising generation uh, at the time, connecting with such a, a, a vast story um, and uh, quite inspiring to someone who uh, uh, talks about history uh, and helping to connect people to the story of this place, but finding that others were connected as well. Um, so it just uh, that's just a byline and, and, a, and a tip of the hat, if you will to uh, students from uh, several years past from Arendelle Secondary School and uh, bringing to, uh, to light and to image uh, the stories that they thought shaped Mississauga. So with that as a bit of an intro, we're gonna jump with both feet into the story of shaping Mississauga. Um, a presentation like this is about telling the story. I always think the, the inspiration behind uh, a program like this is the story is, what if Mississauga had a singular voice? Uh, the idea of I am Mississauga. Uh, what story would it tell? Uh, what, what's the story of its life? We, we probably all know the concepts of, uh, of genealogy in a sense, and uh, Shaping Mississauga is a, kind of an attempt, if you will, to give a, a voice to the, the story of the evolution uh, and the generational change uh, that is Mississauga, if it was a singular identity in the building blocks that make up this place. Of course, it's not a singular identity, and that's part of the, the, the fascinating part of, of weaving a story like this, uh, chronologically speaking. 
all of these elements that we'll talk about play a part in the identity of this place. But that story never change, never ends. It's it's an ongoing story. It's a, an evolving story, and I'm not uh, going to attempt to bring it up to really the current age, if you will. Uh, that's that's for future historians to to write. Um, but uh, we are going to explore kind of the building blocks that we, it comes to that come to create what is now the city of Mississauga. Uh, and we'll turn that over to the rising generation to write more current chapters, uh, if you will. But uh, uh, as I said, it's, it's kind of a, an idea of, of uh, a presentation of milestones, a presentation of moments in time stitched together to create uh, an identity of, of a source. But um, can we give it a voice? Can we explore the tapestry and the signposts of, of, of uh, geographic change on the landscape and, and how things that we perhaps interact with on a daily basis, but take very little notice of because they are vernacular things on the landscape that we perhaps uh, glaze over and drive by, not really contemplating what they mean or what their story is. And there's stories all around us. Um, the landscape, buildings, uh, road names, park names, etc. they can all tell a story. You just you kind of have to know the questions to ask or, or perhaps more importantly how to listen to it. Um, I'm, I'm uh, always inspired by a, a book by uh, Thomas McElwraith, uh, Professor Thomas McElwraith, Searching for Old Ontario, um, and just a, a fascinating way to uh, interact with landscape and uh, uh, geography and understanding that, that um, uh, ever, ever dynamic interrelation between people and place and, and land. Um, land shapes people, people have shaped land, and that never ends. Um, and that's part of understanding the, the story of this place, or trying to come to, to, come to grips with the, the, the evolving story of Mississauga. Uh, it's also about developing a concept of rootedness. Um, this is something that uh, in our current day, I think, is, is very prevalent for us to think about. Um, the, uh, you know, can we give, uh, can we create myths and stories and legends around this place? And uh, what do they say about uh, uh, the, the history of this place? What is important, not only to us, uh, those who record and share history, but to a rising a younger generation, um, a current generation? Uh, how are they connected to this place? What is important to them? Are, are there, you know, folklore, collective stories, the buildings that are left behind? Uh, we have to kind of bridge those uh, those, those uh, gaps in our history when it, it comes to understanding the the uh, evolution of time from, say, colonial era settlement um, uh, right up to the modern era, and how those uh, um, play a role with understanding of the place in itself. Um, we use the term rootedness sometimes. It's not really a word, but uh, the concept being uh, connecting to the place in which you live, being curious about it. I always say if I can get people curious about the place in which they live, um, uh, I'm halfway to winning the battle of caring about it. Uh, if we can get you curious about it, you're, you, you, you might explore it a little bit more, you might develop a connection to it. Um, hopefully then you'll, you, you'll care about it. And if you care, if you care about it, then you might uh, uh, develop roots here. You might want to stay here. And, uh, uh, and, and that again is the connected, the development of rootedness. Uh, we also have to explore those things. Uh, history is not frozen in time. Um, we, we continue to interact with it and, and, and history is uh, one component of developing a, a sense of place and, and a pride in that place. Uh, but we have to um, uh, use a, a critical lens. Um, again, history is not frozen in time and the way in which we interact with history is constantly changing and, uh, uh, and it should. Um, we should uh, look at our own stories with a, with a critical lens and we should evaluate uh, continuously what is uh, what is important uh, then and to us today. Uh, if history uh, ceases to uh, uh, assist in developing a pride in the sense of place, then we, we need to be critical in our view of that. Um, and again, it, it really is about connecting to the rising generation. The, the old adage about uh, from these failing hands, uh, we, we pass the torch. Uh, the, the torch is always passed from one generation to the next. and. Uh, Hopefully, with them, the the uh, the, the, the interesting uh, aspects of the story of this place are, are passed from one generation to the next to build upon, and uh, a really valuable thing of, of of leaning on those who came before us and, their, and the stories that uh, were recorded, but also continually to strive and and record new stories and uh, explore our, our our collective history with a a different lens uh, with each generation of 
uh, the things that we're looking for, the things we're looking to share, the things we're looking to explore. Um, not all history is black and white. Uh, very rarely is it ever. Um, and uh, you know, I always uh, say to sometimes if we celebrate the the light. Uh, we also have to embrace the, the darker chapters as well. And and every place, including this one, has that myriad of of, uh, of layers, if you will. Uh, we are no different. And. Um, uh, we develop ways to try and connect to that rising generation. And one of the successful things that we've uh, developed here at Heritage Mississauga is uh, an annual comic book uh, uh, called the Grange Comic Book Series, and uh, just different ways to explore and you know uh, ask those questions, be curious about the place you live, develop those connectedness, um, uh, care about the place, pride in the place. Um, rootedness that comes back to that and, and this presentation is, is really connected to that concept of exploring this place and exploring the roots of this place um jumping into the the story itself uh again uh, people have shaped geography but probably more prevalent uh, geography has shaped people um uh, glaciation in lake iroquois for you know about ten thousand years ago we were under uh, a massive ice sheet kilometers uh, thick pressing down on this land and carving out the landscape uh, behind it. And we, we can see elements of that today in the, in, the, in the escarpment along the Credit River Valley and the kind of the scars on the landscape from thousands of years ago. Um, our geography that is now the city of Mississauga has been shaped by eons, like eons and uh, relentless change, and that does not end. Um, uh, some of the things that uh, were on our early landscape, uh, the landscape may evolve by generations um, and transportation changes. Like uh, the one picture here shows a, a car, uh, early 1920s, likely navigating a slope, which we still navigate to this day. Uh, I always laugh at the, the picture. I think, oh, I hope his brakes work. Uh, that's Dundas Street at Mavis Road, uh, or more significantly uh, then known as uh, part of State Bank Road, um, and uh, navigating southward down the escarpment, uh, probably likely on his way down to, to Port Credit, but uh, uh, was a uh, switchback uh, uh, route as so you navigate down that very steep hill. That hill was imposing uh, to, to, to many early, early settlers and early lands, uh, or things like railways and roadways and transportation networks and, and the like uh, was, was a daunting task. And those are elements of those ancient shorelines that connect to the glacial period. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, our soils help tell that route, uh, soils with the uh, uh, clay and, and gravel deposits uh, uh, north of that uh, Dundas Street line here in Mississauga where the, the ridge was and below the fertile soils that allow for you know tremendous fruit growing opportunities and the like but uh, I just say again our landscape shaped by, by eons of change um, and we are defined in a way by the river that courses through our midst the the Credit River has uh, drawn people for for thousands of years indigenous people and the early settlers and uh, even today through our recreational offer opportunities but uh, the, the the river more precisely the, the, the water power provided uh, fresh water and fisheries and water power uh, were significant to the evolution uh, the story of, of the city of Mississauga itself the watershed of the, the credit river from its headwaters uh, north of Orangeville uh, all the way through uh, parts of uh, Peel and Halton counties and beyond uh, cover a thousand square miles, uh, all its tributaries and the like. And uh, uh, it, it, it seems to flow passively through our community. And we often forget the, the important lifeblood that it provided to that or those early stages of our development, again, through indigenous and the early settling period, the, the river was key. Um, and uh, credit, what's in a name? Um, the Credit River der derives its name from a custom of trade. That was a custom based on trust uh, to uh, the uh, indigenous Mississaugas. The river was known as the Missinihi, the, trist the Trusting Creek or the Creek of Trust, which was a reference to uh, an economic trade that took place along its shore. That was a trade uh, of, uh, of um, ammunition, pots and pans, clothing and the like from European tra uh, traders to indigenous hunters who would then return the payment, uh, return uh, the, um, the promise, the credit that was granted with furs the following spring after the winter hunting season. Uh, so a uh, river of trust, a river of credit, uh, Riviere au Credit, as the as, uh, early French traders called it, it derives its name today as the Credit River, the River of Trust. 
Um, and uh, who? how about the story of the Mississaugas and the signing of the treaties? And the indigenous Mississaugas uh, were integral to understanding the, the evolution of this landscape. They were not the first indigenous people on this land. Uh, we have uh, uh, archaeological evidence of indigenous habitation on this, on this uh, land long before the Mississaugas, thousands of years. But the Mississaugas from uh, about the 1720s, um, to use our, our modern calendar into uh, right up to the current uh, the, the current years, we we today live within the uh, traditional lands of the of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, the Mississaugas were uh, the inhabitants of this area at the time of British contact, uh, British arrival, um, and the seeking of. of uh, treaties following the American Revolution. Uh, the influx of Loyalist settlers uh, really, really uh, prompted the British Crown to uh, to acquire land, uh, principally from the Mississaugas in what is now southern Ontario, uh, in a series of treaties. And when it comes to the city of Mississauga, we're involved in three uh, significant treaties. Um, uh, Provisional Treaty uh, 13A, 13 Addendum, was signed on August 2nd of 1805, and it laid out a promise of just over 70,000 acres of land from uh, the uh, Lake Ontario shoreline to a depth of six miles. In the city of Mississauga, that six-mile line is marked by Eglinton Avenue today. Um, that treaty, uh, the Provisional Treaty of 1805, which was ratified a year later in September of 1806 with the head of the Lake Treaty, uh, that was known as Treaty 14. Um, that was, uh, it's, again, uh, it set aside 70,000 uh, and some odd acres of land, uh, with the exception of one mile each side of the Credit River, uh, which would be known as the Credit Indian Reserve. In 1818, the British Crown was back, um, and uh, at this point, uh, they uh, agreed to, uh, the Mississaugas agreed to surrender uh, land north of that six mile line, north of Eglinton Avenue, throughout Peel and Halton counties, to a tune of 648,000 acres of land, for which they were paid a thousand pound province, uh, province uh, currency, uh, get, given in trade goods over a series of years. Um, and then finally, in 1820, the British Crown is back again, and this time they're looking at that one mile stretch on each side of the Credit River uh, that was set aside in the uh, in the promises of 1805, um, as well as the fisheries to the Topo Creek, uh, 60 mile creek, and 12 mile creek that had been set aside in that. So, um, in a very short order of time, uh, in 15 years, less than a generation, uh, less than half a lifetime, um, the Mississaugas had, uh, by way of treaty, had surrendered to the crown uh, vast acres of land retaining only 200 uh, titles to only 200 acres of land um, and we can look we can explore this topic in terms of uh, uh, negotiations in good faith um, and uh, whether or not uh, promises were met uh, I think they're fairly conclusive evidence that they were not um, and uh, a lot of these, these uh, dealings with the British Crown and Indigenous peoples, and Mississauga is included in that, are subject to the lands claims research that goes on to this day. Um, but uh, um, at this point, uh, follow, a year following each of those treaties, so in 1806, 1819, and 1821-22, that's when the surveyors come through in the, in the, uh, in the um, advance guard, if you will, of, of the settlement that would immediately follow. Um, and so the, the, in very short order, the Mississaugas have surrendered almost all of their territory. Um, whether or not, again, they understood the terms of what surrendering land meant um, and uh, what uh, private ownership meant, uh, that's another story unto itself. But um, uh, pretty conclusive evidence to suggest that the British Crown knew that the Mississaugas did not know uh, what they were agreeing to in terms of land severances and land uh, private land ownership, but uh, again, uh, immediately following those treaty uh, those treaties that were signed, we see the surveyors come through in the beginnings of uh, settlement period uh, in what would become in the city of Mississauga. Um, enter into uh, an individual who was dynamic at any point in time in history, and perhaps. Uh, in this historian's point of view, perhaps the most uh, significant individual to ever reside within what is now the city of Mississauga. Um, uh, Reverend Peter Jones, uh, connected to the story of the Credit Mission Village um, for the indigenous Mississaugas. 
he was a man who walked with a foot in two worlds, as one of the sayings go. Uh, he was uh, the son of a Welsh surveyor uh, and the grandson of an indigenous Mississauga chief from the Credit River. Um, and uh, Peter Jones led uh, a fascinating life that included being raised for a period of time with his uh, grandfather's people, his mother's people at the Credit Mission and, and uh, other locations as well, being raised as an indigenous Mississauga person. Um, and then at a young, uh, as a young teenager being recalled the Stony Creek by his father and sent to school where he learns to read and write and particularly good with numbers, seemed to be a bright individual, uh, apprentice to be an accountant. Um, and when his uh, grandfather passes away, uh, he has a, a choice to make. What uh, what life would he follow? Um, and uh, it's, it is to the story of the Indigenous Mississauga, the story of his youth, that he connects himself. Um, uh, and uh, he also, however, uh, uh, in addition to being a chief of the Mississauga, he is convert, he finds, uh, finds Christianity, the Methodist fee, uh, faith. Uh, and he's ordained as a Methodist minister. So no, this is an individual, again, um, uh, a complicated man for his times, but uh, use the term perhaps loosely as a Renaissance individual. Um, he is someone who connects to both cultures, uh, someone who can speak eloquently in English and, and be fluent uh, uh, as, uh, in Ojibwa as um, a leader of the Anishinaabe people. Um, and Peter Jones, uh, a significant individual who labors tirelessly on behalf of uh, his followers uh, at the Credit Mission. It's under his direction um, and that of James Gibbons at uh, the Credit Mission Village at uh, near what is now the most uh, the Mississauga Gulf Country Club was built in 1826. Um, and under his direction, as well as his uncle, uh, Chief Joseph Sawyer, uh, and, his, and his brother, John Jones, um, and uh, also a lifelong friend in Egerton Ryerson, it's under their leadership that the Credit Mission Village comes to flourish. And, and Peter Jones spends a great deal of his time um, traveling, um, both as a, as, a, as a Methodist minister or a missionary, uh, but also uh, laboring on behalf of his people and the, and the desire to uh, to get title back to their land, which he never does achieve in his life. But uh, um, uh, we won't spend a lot of time on Peter Jones. We could we could talk for for a long period of time, and uh, I highly recommend for perhaps one of the most fascinating books ever written on the story of. of, of of this place, Mississauga, is that of the Sacred Feathers by Donald Smith, which is the life and times of Reverend Peter Jones, Kekake Kwanabai, known as Sacred Feathers, uh, chief of the Mississaugas. Um, and it's under his direction in 1846-47 that the Mississaugas relocate from here and establish new credit um, south of Brantford, Ontario, which is where their descendants live to this day. Um, an intertwined story with this place and uh, with a nod to the Mississaugas today, uh, we stand on their traditional territories and, uh, and share in the stories of Peter Jones and the impact he had on both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, a dynamic uh, individual at any point in time and uh, well worth exploring further. Um, archaeological evidence. Uh, we live in a city of multiple layers. I've always said that if it uh, doesn't matter where you walk or live in Mississauga, somebody has walked or lived there before. Uh, perhaps not in the same house that you're in, but certainly on the same piece of land. Again, uh, over thousands of years, people have interacted with this landscape, uh, generations upon generations, and m multiple, multiple uh, archaeological sites uh, throughout the city. Uh, uh, and uh, just to tell a, a vibrant story of the layers of this place. Um, and again, wherever you live, wherever you walk, someone has been there before. Um, and it's just a fascinating way to look at the, the evolution of the stories and the, the different cultures that have lived in this, uh, in this geographic area over a long period of time. Um, following the uh, the treaties with the indigenous Mississaugas, um, uh, land is, is surveyed and we have surveys that come through uh, 1806, what was known as the old survey of Toronto Township, uh, 18, that's south of Eglinton Avenue, excluding the one mile each side of the Credit River. Uh, 1819 is north of Eglinton Avenue. Uh, 1822 is the land within what is now the um, uh, one mile each side of the Credit River, uh, with the exception of land set aside south of the Dundas alignment. Um, and then in 1846, the land south of the Dundas alignment uh, is also surveyed. So we have these these multiple layers of a survey within what is uh, the city of Mississauga today. Uh, Peel, uh, as it was laid out, uh, it originally consisted of five townships. Uh, 
uh, region appeal consists of, of uh, three today, but historically the five townships uh, starting in the north were Caledon and Albion uh, and uh, Shinkuzi and then uh, Toronto Gore and Toronto. Uh, Toronto Township and part of Toronto Gore became the town and then the city of Mississauga. Uh, Shinkuzi and part of Albion became what is now Brampton and Caledon and part of Albion became Caledon. Uh, so originally five townships, now uh, three within the region of Peel, uh, but Peel County, um, our historic entity to which we are attached as part of what was then known as the home district. Um, our landscape is not really one of ancient history. On the left there, we see uh, land as it was uh, aligned in 1954. On the right, the same parcel of land uh, in 2019. Uh, a landscape of layers, but if you peel back a, uh, enough, you'll still see the uh, cadastral survey system, the, the grids, if you will, on the landscape, the, the uh, squares, rectangles, right angles, and the like. That's still very much part of our landscape. Again, a, a landscape a little bit like a layer of onions. Uh, you, uh, you peel a layer back and there's a layer underneath, and our base layer is the, 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 uh, the survey that comes through and creates the cadastral road network or cadastral uh, field system that is the base unit for all understanding kind of the, the uh, geography of this place as it has evolved over time. Again, if you zoom back far enough, you'll still see that, uh, that grid system uh, that in some cases stretches back over 200 years old uh, within, our, within our community, still peeking its way through. Um, again, wherever you've lived, wherever you've walked in, the, in this community, someone has lived or walked there before. And uh, uh, you can just have to stand at you know, a, a corner of, a, of an intersection, if you will. Um, uh, I, I always say the uh, one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken uh, is down in the bottom uh, center here. You'll see uh, a, a road sign, uh, Dundas Street West and Fifth Line West. You can still stand at that intersection today, and I encourage you to do so if, if you have a chance. It's just uh, just to the west of Aramos Parkway on Dundas Street, and uh, um, you stand there, and you'll be standing at an intersection that people have connected with for over 200 years. It was surveyed in 1806, um, and uh, if you look curiously or closely at the sign, you might uh, ponder the next time you see it, how do two west roads intersect? Uh, Dundas Street West and Fifth Line West. Um, it's a little bit of a subterfuge on the, on the landscape itself, and uh, um, uh, they are two west roads and they do intersect although one of them was only one of them actually runs east west and that's dundas street fifth line was simply the fifth north south line surveyed parallel to the center road and west of the center road very confusing to say we can explore surveys another time but uh, just fascinating the way in which our history peeks through that intersection uh, fifth line never receiving another name and uh, this historian would argue never should uh it's a it's a way in which our our, our history peeks through in very subtle ways but fifth line west uh, uh, surveyed in uh, in 1806 as a as a north south road uh, west of the center point. Uh, Dundas Street runs east or west up here on Ontario Street. Wherever you live in Mississauga, you live as part of that cadastral grid system. You are either north or south of Dundas Street and east or west of here on Ontario Street, and uh, everything was numbered. And uh, only one of those numbers would uh, would pertain to a particular piece of property, historically speaking. And so, just a fascinating element. Our base unit of, of division of the land was uh, based on a 200 acre plot of land um, and then north of Eglinton Avenue a 100 acre plot of land but they were they, that's our base unit if you will of, of measurement on the landscape and everything since then is subdivisions of subdivisions within that but uh, this is a fascinating way in which our, our history peeks through at least to, at least to this historian. Um, Toronto Township, the, the place name for historic Mississauga, uh, uh, Township of Toronto, Toronto Township. Yes, there were two Torontos and they lived side by side for a long period of time, but we had a name first. So yes, the city of Toronto, uh, knows the, known by the name today, was originally the town of York, uh, took its name as the city of Toronto in 1834. However, this place was already Toronto Township uh, as of 1806. Uh, and so uh, a little bit of our argument to come 1967 uh, that Toronto Township could not become the town of Toronto because the city of Toronto was uh, next door uh, and they already had claim to the name. So we had to choose a different name. 
I'll talk about that in a little bit later as well. Uh, but Toronto Township uh, were often what we refer to as historic of Mississauga, uh, very much part of uh, the identity of this place. We had a coat of arms. It was a, a, co a, a scales of justice. Uh, our civic colors at the time were blue and silver, uh, along with the uh, the motto "Fiat Justitia, Let Justice Be Done." We're not really sure why that was named. That was the the, the motto of uh, Toronto Township and uh, the scales of justice being uh, being uh, chosen for this place because we didn't have the courthouses at the time. But nonetheless, that was the historic coat of arms for the city of Mississauga. Um, Peel County was created in 1851 uh, and, sur and survived as Peel County up until 1973 when it became a region of Peel. Um, and our first town hall, the first Toronto Township town hall survives in Streetsville as a private residence today on Church Street uh, in Streetsville. So uh, we've had lots of town halls over time, uh, city halls, if you will. Uh, the, the current and the oldest survive, uh, the four or five in between do not. Um, but uh, uh, you, you can see just from the, uh, the sheer uh, size of the original place versus what we have today, our municipal structure has grown significantly uh, over time. Um, from home district to Peel County, again, we've, we've dealt with this a little bit. Um, the five townships have become three. Uh, we're Peel now home to the city of Mississauga, the city of Brampton, and the town of Caledon. Albion and Toronto Gore have disappeared, at least as legal entities within, uh, within Peel and been absorbed into the others. Um, when uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but I always say when uh, when Halton wasn't working, Mississauga took some more land. Uh, not quite that uh, that simple, but uh, through a, a expansion of our western border here in Mississauga, uh, our our border, which was originally Winston Churchill, has expanded out to uh, out to Ninth Line, uh, just in the in the kind of the central Mississauga area. Uh, Winston Churchill, originally known as Town Line, um, and uh, denoted the the separation, if you will between uh, historic uh, Mississauga and, uh, and Oakville or Peel and Halton. But uh, in 2010, that border has changed at least for what is now the city of Mississauga. Um, and uh, you, you might wonder again at that number system as you're, if you're driving uh, in Mississauga from uh, uh, Winston Churchill, the next road to the west, you're gonna find uh, uh, 10th line uh, west and then, or 10th line and then 9th line west as it's called. Um, not quite uh, accurate in, in those terms because uh, historically ninth and tenth lines did not belong to us. Uh, they were part of the uh, the Halton County or Trafalgar Township survey and they radiated eastward from a central starting place over on Tremaine Road and so technically they were never uh, given a, a, a geographic orientation. It's the city of Mississauga that slapped a, a west on tenth line but uh, historically that didn't uh, make a lot of sense uh, when you you look at the landscape itself because our, our our town line if you will Winston Churchill would be seventh line uh, seventh line west um, and then the next road over would be tenth but that's simply because of the two surveys that butted up against each other this historian can can talk for hours on, on surveys and what it is in the landscape but that usually bores a lot of people so we'll, we'll, we'll skip over that a little bit but uh, uh, I always say let's take the uh, uh, let's take the west off tenth line and uh, perhaps throw east on it just for uh, for fun of a, of a historic conversation. Um, loyal she began. Um, uh, what is Ontario or then Upper Canada, later Canada West, was uh, was severed off uh, or created as a, um, uh, a political uh, independent entity from uh, from the British territories of Quebec. Um, and uh, lower upper and lower Canada were created upper Canada principally as a refuge uh, or a new homeland for United Empire loyalist settlers following the American Revolution. Those were uh, American born uh, settlers who uh, remained loyal to the British Crown during the upheaval uh, in the 1790s uh, when the uh, American colonies broke away from Great Britain. Um, and in um, consequence of their, their loyalty suffered losses um, and then uh, became the became refugees uh, of that conflict and finding their way northwards under a under new homeland under British rule, a province is created and uh, Ontario's motto translates as loyal she began, loyal she remains in uh, connection to this heritage of a uh, United Empire Loyalist or UE settlement. Uh, you can still fi find the symbols UE on a number of gravestones in our historic cemeteries such as Spring Creek Cemetery 
and Clarkson Road for many of the settlers that settled in uh, along historic Dundas Street and principally in the Clarkson area can uh, tie the roots back to the Loyalist settlement following the American Revolution. Um, things like uh, settlement duties became part of the norm once a lot was drawn. The lots would be created after the, the surveys. Lots would be drawn, settlers would come in and they would have to complete what were settlement duties. That is a clearance of, uh, of a quarter of their acreage of land, a uh, house, a minimum 12 by 20 log cabin erected, a portion of that cleared land fenced, a crop, uh, a crop planted, and the road alignments, any road that uh, abutted your property to be cleared as well. And once those things were completed, it's supposed to be three to five years, you would then get titled to your land. Those are called settlement duties. In reality, settlement duties often took a lot longer than, than the time described, but uh, nonetheless, a very slowly at first, our landscapes begins to change into the settlement era of landscape. Our first concerted effort or attempt at, that, at a group of settlement was down in the Clarkson area, what was known as Marigold's Point. Uh, and uh, if we have to point to an individual as being kind of first on the ground, we always say it's kind of in the the, the spring of, uh, of 1807, Henry Gable in the extreme southwest corner of our city, um, having received a land grant in December of 1806 and the spring of 1807, we believe he is on the ground, uh, well, likely with his family in tow and uh, become kind of our first attempt to do uh, settler making improvements on a lot, or what were called then improvements on a lot uh, in advance of uh, getting title to his land. Um, the area around Clarkson became known as, as Marigold's Point, and you can explore the story of that place with uh, uh, the families of Marigold's Point uh, as, a, as a small local uh, book publication. Um, not long after those are early waves of settlement were, were our first kind of concerted wave of settlement in 1807 and 1808. Um, and uh, a few short years after that, uh, remember many of these people are born in the United States or, or children of those born in the United States. Um, we have the outbreak of hostilities between uh, the British Crown and uh, the um, uh, United States of America, which is spill over in the War of 1812. And again, this is one of those topics we can spend a lot more time on uh, than just a brief narrative in this. But uh, uh, local militia volunteers uh, joined what was then known as the Second York Militia or the Second Regiment of York Militia, um, and uh, and would serve in a variety of capacities. Uh, uh, road maintenance being probably one of the more more prevalent ones, but also uh, garrison duty and supply depots. Uh, they uh, sometimes found themselves in harm's way, not by choice, but more by accident and, and, uh, and location. They might be manning a supply-based depot or being a uh, kind of reinforced detachment. Uh, reinforcement detachment uh, the, at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and uh, members of the Second York uh, found themselves in a number of different engagements through the war. Uh, capture Fort Detroit, uh, Princeton Heights, uh, where uh, the death of General Brock took place, uh, Battle of Stony Creek, uh, Battle of Lundy's Lane and others. Um, we have identified uh, uh, 54 uh, volunteers from historic Mississauga who uh, resided or owned land in what is now the city of Mississauga at the, in June of 1812 when war was declared. Of those 54 who served in the militia, 37 of them are buried within the city of Mississauga today. So you talk about a place with old roots. There are six historic cemeteries, actually seven, sorry, seven historic cemeteries in Mississauga that have a few, uh, have veterans of the War of 1812 uh, buried therein. Um, and uh, just to kind of make a, a fascinating story even richer, we also are final resting place to at least one American militiaman uh, who served on the American side during the War of 1812 and came to Canada following the war and settling in the Streetsville area. But this is a fascinating way to explore the history of our community. If you'd like to learn more, we'll do a presentation in the future on, on the War of 1812 and, and local connections to that moment in time. Um, following that, you have another wave of settlement that comes through, and, and really this is kind of the, the, the burgeoning of, of communities that we've come to recognize today. Um, we kind of look at our, our, our found villages, if you will. If you ever go to council chambers at City Hall and, and uh, look up at the, 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 the amazing ceiling at City Hall, you're going to see the names that uh, make up historic Mississauga that we all recognize in some fashion today. Places that were once individual that uh, were amalgamated together first to create the town of Mississauga and then the, in 1968 and the city in 1974. Clarkson, Cooksville, Dixie, Arendale, Lakeview, Lorne Park, Malton, Medova Village, Port Credit, and Streetsville, all very integral to the development story of this place. And every one of them has an individual history of them of, of, of their own. These were once places independent of 
each other and fascinating ways to, to kind of explore our landscape as we look at the history of these individual places. Uh, again, there's lots of ways to find out more information. Uh, each one of these locations also has a self-guided self heritage tour brochure, which you can pick up from our office or consult online uh, and explore these places and these fascinating elements of history of, uh, of our, our city. Uh, so city, Mississauga, very much a city of villages. Um, there are many villages, sorry, that uh, uh, disappeared before this that we don't recognize their place names, but they're found in other ways, uh, park names, road names today that remember those lost, those lost villages places. Um, and there were many of these little hamlets that disappeared over time, uh, Britannia, uh, uh, Barberton, uh, Burnhamthorpe, uh, Derry West, um, Palestine, Elmbank, Mount Charles. I can go on and on. There's a, a vast history there and we can explore the lost villages at, a, at another time. But it's just a, 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 an amazing way to look at the landscape and how it's changed over time. If you're ever driving around the city and you see kind of these uh, historic cemeteries that appear out of look, uh, uh, kind of lost amidst modern suburbia, well, the cemeteries are where they're there first. Uh, we have uh, multiple historic cemeteries, little crossroads uh, areas that in some cases are the only reminder of the community that once was. They, they become the lost villages of this place. Um, we can look at uh, the story of kind of founders, if you will, and, and much like any place we have uh, copious records pertaining to uh, kind of male founders, uh, very patriarchal look at them, look at history. Of course, that not truly the case. There were those that were uh, dynamic women that helped shape this place as well. And uh, we try to kind of uh, look at all cultures and all, all genders and the role that they played in these communities. But most of our history is written again from that uh, white Anglo-Saxon male perspective. And so we have a lot of stories around that. They, they are not the only stories, of course, but uh, uh, we, we have a ton of records and information pertaining to that. A, a picture like this probably never happened. This is an artist's rendition of kind of the founding fathers, if you will, of getting together it comes out of a, a book pertaining to St. Peter's Anglican Church, but uh, these names are scattered throughout the city and, and uh, um, in different ways are connected to the, the stories of these different communities that help make up what is the city of Mississauga today. Did they ever meet each other? Did they all ever sit in a room? Did they ever plan this place? Probably not, um, but uh, it's a fascinating way to think about the, the story of this place. And uh, uh, others, have perhaps more important to the, kind of the understanding the evolution of this place are kind of the business and political minded individuals at the time. Uh, uh, the portrait in the, on the left side there is, uh, is William Thompson, Colonel William Thompson, a veteran of the War of 1812. Our first Reeve, a Reeves an officer will later become mayor. Uh, just a fascinating individual, life and times of, uh, of, uh, of William Thompson. And the other fellow there, the, the balding fellow with the, uh, the, the, the large sideburns, uh, that is a picture from the 1877 Historic Atlas of Peel County. That is Jacob Cook, uh, an industrious, uh, incredibly um, uh, prolific business uh, individual. Uh, Cooksville, of course, takes his name from Jacob Cook, a fellow who uh, created an incredible male and stagecoach empire uh, centered here in historic Mississauga at the intersection of Dundas Street and here in Ontario. Um, they covered much of the territory between Kingston and Godrich um, and uh, just an amazing story of uh, uh, marvelous mail network uh, and stagecoach service centered in, uh, here, in, uh, here in Mississauga and Cooksville. At here in Ontario, Dundas Street uh, or Centre Road and Highway 5, as they were known historically. Uh, we also have ties to moments in time like the Rebellion of 1837, something perhaps we have percolating as a reference in our, our mindset but not know much about. Um, William Lyon Mackenzie, um, uh, a politician uh, locally elected and then defeated here uh, in, the, in Streetsville, um, but uh, a politician um, out of Toronto. Um, fighting for a seat on the Legislative Council, um, voicing, uh, standing in, in uh, support of, uh, of uh, rural farmers, um, and uh, try pushing against the glass ceiling of what was known as the Family Compact, uh, the ruling, ruling elite at the time, um, and uh, trying to, to kind of shake that institution. Uh, and he did, to its core, uh, largely through organizing a failed revolt or a rebellion, an uprising against the, uh, against the government. It didn't work. Um, there's a lot we can read and go into that story in greater detail, but uh, uh, the uh, act of uh, opposition, if you will, it was enough to draw a lens of, of um, 
colonial powers looking at this place and uh, finding, uh, as it was quoted at the time, uh, two nations warring in the bosom of a single state. Um, the, uh, rebellion, the rebellion, the failed revolt, the rebellion of 1837, shone a spotlight on this place that ultimately led to, uh, to legal changes in the way in which the province was governed and the way, introduction of something as simple uh, that we take for granted today as the, as the um, uh, secret ballot, uh, the, the secret vote um, uh, came out of this moment in time. Um, there were casualties, there were uh, those that lost their lives as a result and a couple of people executed. And for in terms of historic Mississauga, we have people that uh, are remarked to have served on either side, some in, the, in support of the rebellion itself and some on behalf of the crown seeking to suppress that rebellion. Um, and uh, Sir William Lyon Mackenzie and uh, the failed rebellion of 1837 led to some significant changes. Uh, there's a fascinating story called uh, a book by his son-in-law, Charles Lindsay, called Life and Times of William Lyon Mackenzie. And uh, just a fascinating read because part of the book deals specifically with this place and his flight from justice, which took three days to cross historic Mississauga and the places in which he uh, uh, the, the rebel leaders uh, was uh, sheltered and ultimately uh, finding his way to the border and escaping. Fascinating story. Um, also, Mississauga as a place of refuge and no, new beginnings. Um, we uh, tied to the the evolution of um, of uh, fugitive and former slaves whether it be emancipated slaves and free blacks looking for uh, a safe haven away from uh, what was happening south of the border in terms of uh, oppression of individuals and civil rights something that resonates strongly to this day um, historic mississauga and indeed large parts of, of canada were seen as a refuge and a place of, 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 of restarting if you will um, it wasn't, uh, Mississauga was not a place free of um, the attitudes that, uh, that um, racism, we, we, we would look at it today in those lenses, but there were those that found safe refuge here um, and, and looked to establish themselves here. Notably the Ross family of Cedar Park Farm and, uh, and, and that's the story that was explored in many other, uh, other avenues, but uh, um, just some incredible stories uh, pertaining to early black settlers from this community and the way in which they re uh, found a refuge and a place to restart, even in a place that, although uh, we like to think of as a, as a welcoming place, we know that there's evidence that it wasn't always as, as, as that way, but uh, we, can, we can look at the stories of, of the Ross Farm and a few others that uh, talk about this place as a place of new beginnings. Um, also tying to that uh, a story of new beginnings is really that of Irish immigrants, uh, particularly Irish Catholic immigrants from the 1840s and 1850s, the great migra migration of Irish peoples during the, the Irish potato famine. We had um, uh, lots of stories of early Irish communities, Chloe Nahi, which would later merge into the community of Elmbank uh, up near the airport is the airport today, perhaps more strikingly. The story of uh, of Diamond, um, we, uh, local newspapers refer to it as the Catholic Swamp, around Ninth Line and Britannia Road. Um, these became very concerted efforts, uh, uh, concerted um, uh, attempts at uh, Irish Catholic settlements within what is now historic Mississauga. Um, a fascinating story evolves around uh, Colonel Connell James Baldwin, the individual in the bottom there, um, who was. Uh, an Irish Catholic who rose uh, to the rank of colonel within the British Army um, and following the Napoleonic Wars uh, received land in what is now historic Mississauga up near the airport uh, and he used his property and indeed his own finances to help uh, support many of those poor Irish that came over during the potato famine years to uh, to gain them a new start in life and so uh, a fellow who is largely uh, unknown within our history today played a very significant role for many uh, in this uh, in the early years of this uh, this community this is a fascinating way to look at the the evolution of this place we can also see the evolution of the landscape changes with the arrival of uh, you know planes trains and automobiles to play on a, on a 
an old movie title. Um, we have uh, trains arriving in 1854 with the Grand Trunk through the Malton area of Mississauga. 1855, the Great Western uh, Railway comes through uh, parallel to Lakeshore Road down in the Clarkson, Fort Credit, and Lakeview areas. And then 1879, the Johnny Come Lately to the, the Railway craze was the Credit Valley Railway that uh, ran in part parallel to Dundas Street and then swept up through uh, through Streetsville and Meadowvale and beyond. Um, but those those rights of ways that are created um, uh, do not disappear on their landscape and uh, and remain as integral transportation corridors within the ge geography that is the city of Mississauga today. Uh, motor cars, uh, automobiles arrived in the early 1900s, but it wasn't really until the 1920s that uh, roads began to be improved greatly and transportation was, uh, was uh, transportation avenues were increased and uh, distances were, were expanded upon. Uh, and so the automobiles, once they arrived, the trains and the automobiles, and for a very short period of time, the radio railway, which was kind of um, an intercity uh, uh, electric uh, streetcar service uh, that ran for a time. It's, it's kind of funny, history has a, as an interesting way of uh, kind of uh, seeing itself. Uh, we, we live in an era with the LRT construction that's happening down here on Terra Street today, uh, light rapid transit, um, and uh, yeah, we look back in time and we had one. Uh, we had one from the early 1900s up until 1931, um, but ultimately that was abandoned uh, due to kind of competition from trucks and the, the lack of profitability of the, of the line. But uh, there was a period of time when a streetcar did run, or what we consider a streetcar or an electric railway, did run uh, through historic Mississauga, but uh, of course no longer. Uh, and uh, LRT again, a neat way of way history peeks through the covers again um, and uh, uh, makes its imprint on the landscape. Uh, we're also tied to the story of Confederation. Of course, we know Confederation in Canada takes place in, um, it comes to be in 1867, uh, July 1st of 1867. Uh, but the road to Confederation was a long one and began um, arguably a decade before that, if not longer. We, of course, know the uh, uh, kind of the connections to our, our first uh, uh, prime minister, Fathers of Confederation, uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, um, uh, arguably one of the ones that most uh, most impactful to the creation of, of uh, of Confederation, at least as it happened in 1867, was um, uh, the founder of the Globe, George Brown, a uh, politician and newspaper man, but uh, it was his uh, olive branch of uh, walking across the floor and joining his, his uh, arch rival and, and uh, the, um, the opposition united as a grand coalition, which would lead the way, uh, putting aside party politics, to the betterment of the country, and that was the creation of, of uh, of, uh, of confederation. Uh, we are home to a father of confederation um, that was, um, um, well, we had a couple of politicians, sorry. Uh, first of all, on the right there is uh, is uh, Cameron, uh, John Hilliard Cameron, who was a member of the Conservative uh, Party under John A. Macdonald. He's not a father of confederation, but he was our elected uh, politician heading up to uh, uh, the passage of Confederation at the time for Peel County, and the other fellow uh, with the with the beer that's William Pierce Howland, and uh, uh, he he uh, served a portion of uh, kind of southeastern Mississauga and Etobicoke uh, in um, in 1863 and 1867, and uh, becomes a father of Confederation after he too crosses the floor and joins the uh, the Great Coalition under John A. Macdonald, um, the only American-born father of Confederation. And, uh, again, we are home to uh, to a father of Confederation. He is honored or remembered that connection in uh, Confederation Avenue today at the what was uh, Dundas Confederation, the site of the former uh, uh, Mississauga Town Hall and Confederation Square, uh, which honored uh, the uh, uh, the connection to William uh, Sir William Pierce Howland. Um, highways and byways, we, we look at those uh, those avenues of transportation in our landscape in a, in a modern lens today because we they become kind of the background bone of our, of our transportation network. But uh, uh, there was a time when, when these were really passways through a rural countryside, if you will. The QW comes to be in the late 1930s, the 401, the 403, and so on. They follow kind of in concepts and, and uh, initial layouts in the 50s and 60s. Um, of course, the city would develop around those major arteries of, of transportation, but they become defining elements of our, our landscape. And the picture in the corner, uh, the picture in the center, sorry, is, is, is one of my favorites, comes out of the Greenius family, and that is the groundbreaking for what would become uh, the QEW. Gaylord Greenius was a, uh, a, a 
in the Ministry of, of, uh, of Transportation at the time, uh, and that uh, a press off, off, if you will, of the, uh, the, the the turning of the sod for what would become the QW. That picture taken at what is today the intersection of the QEW uh, or formerly Middle Road uh, and Winston Churchill or the town line uh, was taken in 1936. Um, and while we don't know everybody that's in the picture, we do know the horses' names, and that is Mac and Dan. So they take center center stage there of the, the sod uh, turning or the, the groundbreaking picture for what would become the Queen Elizabeth Way in 1936. Uh, of course, the arrival of hydro uh, is something we perhaps we flick a switch and we take for granted uh, having that service within our communities today. Uh, street lights were, were uh, came to Streetsville in 1894 and uh, the Credit River was dammed to create a hydro pond and electric generating station in Arundel, what is now Arundel Park. Uh, with air no light and power, which ran briefly from 1904 to 1923, um, but it was uh, really the um, the creation or the, the harnessing of, of hydro uh, down in Niagara, which uh, through its transmission lines um, um, lit up the night in historic Mississauga, beginning in 19, uh, 1914, 1915 uh, through 1917 and beyond. Um, Sir Adam Beck, um, uh, really someone who's viewed as the father of the hydro system here in uh, in, uh, in uh, Ontario. Um, they had a number of, uh, of uh, showcases, if you will, to kind of sell the concept of, uh, of fire to farms. And one of them was held right here in Mississauga. That top right picture there uh, shows what was known as Beck's Circus. And that was um, just a different ways in which they would illustrate how hydro uh, benefited a farmer. That was held at the Wesley Mite Farm, which is uh, later the Medill Farm which was formerly at Huron Ontario Street, uh, right at the 401. Uh, and that is just a, a place in which they would set up a, a caravan of uh, basically advertisers for the different things that electricity can do for a farmer. And they would go from uh, community to community and all the farmers would flock to it and, and see. And day one was always the, um, uh, the farm machinery, if you will, the, the, the spreaders, the milkers, the, the different things that uh, electricity can do on the farm. Uh, day two was uh, the ways in which could improve the uh, the uh, farm life in the home, uh, the different uh, appliances that could be operated through electricity. So, so I said day day one was uh, was catering to the farmers, and day two was catering to their wives on the on the idea of selling hydro to its uh, rural constituencies, and and it worked. Uh, hydro uh, lines started being drawn through this community uh, in between 1914 and 1917, and. Uh, um, uh, you know, we've never looked back from that uh, that moment in time. Um, we jump forward again uh, through the advent of electricity into the war years. Um, Mississauga has incredible connections to uh, to life under adversity during the war years. Whatever the conflict was there, Mississauga was there. People from Mississauga served in every major conflict that Canada has been involved in. Um, and uh, our cenotaphs and war memorials around our community are just one way in which we connect to that a significant story of time. Uh, remembering the fallen is something that we uh, spend a great deal of time here at, uh, at, at Heritage Mississauga. Uh, when it comes to the war years, yes, we had uh, soldiers who served, but also we had uh, developments on the home front that were uh, connected very significantly to the war effort. Uh, we are home to Canada's first aerodrome, um, air training center, military air training center during the First World War, uh, down at the foot of Dixie Road, uh, south of Lakeshore Road. Um, uh, adjacent to Hydro Road and Lakeshore Road, you'll find a, a plaque that commemorates uh, Canada's first aerodrome, uh, which was here in, again, the historic Mississauga. Uh, also between um, 1891 and, uh, and 1957, we were home to a rifle range, again, south of Lakeshore Road, kind of between Dixie and Coffer Roads in that area. Uh, was known as the Long Branch Rifle Ranges, and this was a, a training facility and shooting range um, up, up between Lakeshore Road and Lake Ontario. Uh, and then the Second World War, we were home to one of the largest manufacturers of small arms munitions uh, within the British Commonwealth, and that was known as Dominion Small Arms Limited, again at the foot of Dixie Road, south of Lakeshore Road, um, and still with us today as a component of that factory, and most of the factory is gone, but what was known as Building 12, or the Small Arms Inspection Building, is still something that is very much a significant component on our landscape, um, and serving new cultural uh, connections to uh, in, in the modern city today, but uh, a significant story to, uh, to tell about the home front efforts and what happened here at home 
during the war years and not to um, uh, not to dismiss other things that took place like the uh, uh, operations of victory aircraft up in Malton and the, and the development of the Lancaster bomber, a very significant component of, of the war year story at home. Um, uh, soldiers from overseas and looking at Mississauga's sacrifice, soldiers from historic Mississauga served in every major conflict uh, right from uh, War of 1812 through the rebellion years of 1837-38 uh, into the Northwest Rebellion, uh, years of Boer War, but uh, really it is the First World War followed by the Second World War where we see our greatest numbers of involvement and as a result casualties as well. Um, our two historic war memorials within our community, uh, the Streetsville uh, War Memorial and uh, the Streets uh, and the Port Credit War Memorial unveiled in 1925 and 1926 respectively, uh, place a number of names uh, throughout our community. Uh, First World War, we have uh, noted um, 96 fallen soldiers from historic Mississauga. In the Second World War, research is ongoing, but uh, the number of that is also in uh, just under 100 at the moment uh, in terms of those that uh, lost their lives in those, uh, those various conflicts. And uh, we seek to tell the story of the fallen you can also visit our uh, our Civic War Memorial, a Veterans War Memorial at City Hall, which was uh, newly created a number of years ago on uh, Celebration Square. But uh, uh, there are different war memorials and uh, plaques of remembrance and honor rolls and like the scattered throughout our city in a variety of locations in which our city identifies and connects with those that paid the, the, the supreme sacrifice for uh, this place we call Mississauga today. Um, and just uh, fascinating ways in which we connect to our story and things we can again explore later uh, with a different program at another time. Uh, also, I encourage you on YouTube to uh, look up uh, a video called I Am Mississauga, which is a story of uh, uh, remembrance and uh, sacrifice and from historic Mississauga. Uh, 1939, uh, arrival of the airport, uh, the top, uh, top right corner there, you'll see um, uh, First terminal building, which is a farmhouse with a tower on top. The the uh, uh, airport is born through um, uh, expropriation of, of rural farms, uh, and that comes to be in 1939, which uh, creation of what would be the Malton Airport. It expands exponentially over time to uh, you know, Canada's busiest and largest airport, uh, um, the Greater Toronto Airports Authority or Pearson International Airport, as it's known today. The largest and busiest airport in Canada is located in. Thank you very much, Mississauga, uh, and uh, very much part of the identity of this place is the enormous entity and infrastructures around uh, an employment base around uh, uh, Pearson International Airport, uh, very much centered and connected to uh, not only Mississauga, but specifically to the Malton, uh, Malton community of Mississauga. Uh, from uh, in October 15th or on October 15th of 1954, we were hit by a hurricane. Um, sometimes we think this can't happen here. Or hurricanes don't, don't hit Mississauga. Well, um, the newspaper headline of there will be there will be rain tonight uh, got it wrong. Um, hurricane Hazel 1954 started out as a kind of a, a typical uh, devastating eastern seaboard hurricane in the United States, but it was a Kind of a perfect storm of a weather system that uh, sucked the hurricane inland over the Allegheny Mountains, uh, making waterfall on Lake Ontario, gaining in strength on Lake Ontario, and then bearing down on, on uh, Toronto and, um, and Mississauga, making landfall centered on the Humber River, but the surrounding rivers, including um, Etobicoke Creek and, and the uh, Credit River. Uh, burst their banks. Uh, was just uh, it, the hurricane moved inland and then just sat there and drenched the, the countryside. And just enormous um, uh, challenges with flooding and uh, damaged property and the like. Um, uh, yes, the, the, the headline of the of the day: there will be rain tonight. Uh, oops, did not quite get that one uh, spot on. Uh, but yes, hit by a major hurricane, Hurricane Hazel, October fifteenth of nineteen fifty four. Uh, there we roll into the story of the Averero, and uh, again, we'll, we'll touch only briefly on this today. We could, we could talk for hours on the subject of the Averero, maybe we will at another time, but uh, Averero, um, uh, something that this, the story, the controversy never truly ends. It's a fascinating story, uh, well worth uh, an in-depth exploration as well. 
the Arrow was a, an all-weather jet interceptor that was um, uh, designed, the design uh, study began in 1953. It was rolled out to the public uh, uh, October 4th of 1957. Uh, first flight, uh, March 25th of 1958, and then abruptly canceled in, on February 20th, Black Friday of 1959, and ordered destroyed. Only five flying arrows were made, um, and uh, they were destroyed and scrapped uh, in, uh, in March of 1959. Um, loads of controversy around it, um, controversy around the cancellation and the ultimate scrapping of it has never really ended, um, and a number of I mean, never ways we can look at that, but a dynamic story uh, connected to uh, historic Mississauga, flown, made, or made, flown, and ultimately destroyed within what is now the city of Mississauga. Um, the Cinderella Township under Re Mary Fix, we we uh, probably of all all recognize the Mayor Hazel McCallion, but. I recall a, a, a guest uh, speaker, a guest uh, um, presentation that she made a number of years ago with us, where she referred to as an individual, Mary Fix, as one of the people that she um, uh, was inspired by and idolized uh, as a young politician. So Mary Fix, uh, kind of a nod from Hazel McCallion, is a very remarkable and, and um, significant uh, a politician here in historic Mississauga. Uh, Mary Fix was a reeve on uh, on at least three different uh, occasions in historic Mississauga and she really promoted strongly uh, the idea of business uh, within Mississauga. It was under her, her tutelage that uh, a lot of that um, early development started taking place of, of uh, more residential areas uh, being built uh, on subdivisions and farm property and the increase of, of uh, corporate partners coming in. A promotional video was created uh, under the direction of Mary Fix uh, called the uh, Cinderella Township. Uh, and if you go to YouTube today, you can actually watch the story of the Cinderella Township as a, a 1950s promotional video for Toronto Township or what is now the city of Mississauga. A uh, fascinating part of that uh, story is uh, likening the story of the Cinderella Township to uh, what else but the Cinderella story. And we all know in Cinderella, there were two ugly stepsisters. Um, and uh, it makes no bones on the, on the, on the, on the video itself that uh, Cinderella in this story is Toronto Township is uh, what is now Mississauga. And the ugly stepsisters lived on either side of her, that being Toronto and Hamilton. And uh, it makes no bones about it in the video. Quite a fun way to look at the exploration of, of this, uh, to explore this place in the 1950s as the story of Cinderella Township. Um, coming out of that, uh, that move for, um, you know, gradual urbanization or suburbanization um, and new developments come the new town concepts. Um, we had early uh, subdivision developments in the 1950s through the developments of Applewood and Park Royal and Sheridan. They become uh, strong elements within the community, but it's the big three developers that come through. First, uh, uh, Bruce McLaughlin's group in the city center developments, which would ultimately in 1973 develop the Square One site, um, and uh, others, Markborough under Peter Peter Langer and uh, and um, Airmost Development Core uh, Corporation under Mark Muzo would develop significant portions of uh, the city of Mississauga and their new town concepts. Um, and each one was to have kind of a town center, literally a town center, and we recognize those names today as uh, Meadowville Town Center. Air Mills Town Center, and of course, under Bruce McLaughlin's tutelage, Square One. If you're going to build a community from scratch, you're going to build it out of building blocks, and the first building block is going to be Square One, which is where the name, of course, comes from. A hat tip on this one to Ron Duquette and, uh, and uh, a lot of the collections around the uh, Bruce McLaughlin developments and Square One. There's a video that's produced by Ron, uh, Ron Duquette several years ago called Father of the City. Um, and perhaps that's something you can uh, you can look up uh, when the library is reopened. The Father of the City is a story of Bruce McLaughlin and the developments around uh, the city center and Square One. Uh, city will happen here. It was a provincial decision that uh, amalgamation would take place, first to create the town and then ultimately the city. Uh, the amalgamation of rural Toronto Township uh, and the unincorporated entities like Arundel and Clarkson and Cooksville and Dixie and Malton and Lakeview and Lauren Park, etc. Uh, that took place on uh, January 1st of 1968. The mayors of the town of Mississauga, uh, Robert Speck, uh, Bob Speck, uh, was the last reeve of Toronto Township, becomes the first mayor of Mississauga. He serves in that capacity from 1968 until his untimely passing in the early 1974. 
he was replaced by an appointed interim uh, mayor, uh, Charles Chick Murray, uh, just for the remainder of 1974, at which point um, the town of Mississauga was then amalgamated with the independent towns of Port Credit and Streetsville. So there are two real waves of amalgamation, um, and that 1974 amalgamation between Mississauga, Port Credit, and Streetsville creates the city of Mississauga. So again, there's a creation of the town in 1968, which did not include Port Credit and Streetsville, and then the town of Mississauga and Port Credit and Streetsville joined in 1974. Whether they wanted to or not, that was a provincial decision, um, and Streetsville fought it tooth and nail, including a counterproposal to amalgamate part of Mississauga into a greater Streetsville. That did not come to be, um, but uh, one of the fascinating things when we look at uh, the story of Mississauga itself is who led the charge uh, for the uh, that uh, that opposition to the, uh, the city of, or the town of Mississauga and the amalgamation of the time was Streetsville Mayor Hazel McCallion, who would later, of course, become mayor of the city of Mississauga. What's in a name itself? The, the name was chosen by, uh, by popular, or in some cases, a contentious, unpopular vote, uh, which was held in the Mississauga News, the already named Mississauga News. So a little bit of anecdotal story, the newspaper that named the town might be some truth to that. Um, the uh, the votes were uh, were the, the voting was held through the newspaper. Um, the uh, multiple they had hundreds of names on the list on the list, which got shortened to ten, uh, which got shortened to three. And the three finalists being Malton, Mississauga, and Sheridan, and then got shortened to two, which were uh, the finalists were Mississauga and Sheridan, and then the population eventually voted on that, and Mississauga won in a landslide. Um, uh, thanks probably in no small part to a smear campaign against the name of Sheridan, uh, held a uh, run in the newspaper itself. Uh, Sheridan was named as a historic community name, which was named for Sir Richard Bris uh, um, Brinsley Sheridan, who was a playwright and a poet and, and perhaps an unscrupulous politician, uh, a number of things written about him over time, never came to Canada, never really had a place named after him as a British politician. And, uh, his name really had no anchoring on this landscape, but uh, the name uh, Mississauga, which was ultimately chosen, was not favored by the council at the time. Um, uh, under Bob Speck, uh, there's a, one article that says, I don't care what they call it as long as it's short and easy to spell. Well, they got Mississauga out of that. And there are a couple of times that council tried to, to, tried to uh, remove Mississauga from consideration, but it was popular outcry that put it back on the ballot each time, and uh, ultimately it's the residents that chose Mississauga. Uh, again, uh, Mississauga, um, uh, uh, chosen by popular vote by our residents, it was a name that was already in use uh, in local associations with things. Mississauga Road was already named. Uh, of course, we knew the connection or knew at least some of the connection between the Mississaugas of the, of the Credit First Nation um, and um, their, their connection to this geography, this place, and the newspaper. It was already called the Mississauga News, so we had some association with that. The translation itself is uh, given as River of the North of Many Mouths. It does not mean this place at all. It refers to the ancestral homeland of the Mississaugas, uh, the Anishinaabe people uh, along the north shore of Lake Huron around the Mississauga and French River areas. Um, but the name comes with the people and uh, gets applied to the geographic base in which they live. And so the Mississaugas themselves uh, find their name uh, placed on this city thanks to a popular vote back in 1968. Um, October 25th, 1969, uh, molten gas explosion. When we look at emergencies, there are a number of them over time, but this is kind of the first major emergency faced by the new town of Mississauga, it was a natural gas pipeline under the, uh, the intersection of Airport Road and Dairy Road in, in Malton that ruptured. Um, and uh, and uh, kind of the first emergency faced by the town would lead to the creation of a, a Peel Emergency Disaster Plan, which would come uh, a decade later into, into, into play. Um, but uh, nonetheless, the first emergency replaced and, and unfortunately it didn't result in a loss of, a loss of life. Um, uh, an elderly woman by the name of Jean Perigo was killed uh, when her house was consumed in, uh, in the explosion uh, off of Malton. Um, square one, I already made reference to the father of the city video. Uh, the part of the picture kind of tells it all. There's a, you know, Ron Duquette uh, provided this picture of square one um, just upon its opening in 1973, uh, looking at the vast farm field beyond. Um, quite a, an amazing scene to see considering how much, uh, how many people live in that variety today, or that, that area today, sorry. Uh, 403 is not even in the, in the, in the corridor yet, in the, in the picture yet. And uh, this was a, 
you know, a visionary um, a developer who is looking to build a city and entice people to come where, where nothing had been before. And square one becomes the, the first building block of that story, if you will, uh, part of the, the building block of what would become the city of Mississauga itself. January 1st, 1974, the amalgamation of the um, uh, town of Mississauga, the town of Streetsville, and the town of Port Credit to create the city of Mississauga. And shortly thereafter, we see uh, a flag that is born out of our, our, uh, our coat of arms. You can still see the flag flying today at a uh, variety of locations like City Hall and fire stations and the like. Um, and uh, a coat of arms, an official coat of arms. And uh, uh, you don't often see the coat of arms in use, and that's, uh, from this historian's perspective, that's a little bit of a shame. I think we should see it a little bit more. It tells a fascinating story. Um, you'll see it on the uh, on the big medallion that hangs behind the, the mayor's chair at the uh, council chambers uh, and on some official uh, documentation. Like, But when you look at the, the story here and uh, the, the coat of arms, uh, with the, the red shield in the middle with the surmounted by a crown of, of maple leaves and the atomic symbol above. There's, there's layers of stories to be told here in, in the coat of arms. Um, the shield itself is emblazoned with um, uh, connections to our past landscape. Uh, the shaft of wheat is taken from uh, Port Credit's coat of arms, denoting a shipping center for agricultural produce. The mill wheel or the cog wheel of industry is inspired from Streetsville's coat of arms, referring to the industries along the Credit River. The uh, wings of aviation come out of the, uh, the connections to Malton and, and, the, uh, and uh, the Pearson Interna what is now Pearson International Airport, uh, surmounted by a crown of maple leaves to connection uh, to this place. Um, loyalty, if you will, to the British Crown as a, as, a, as a part of Canada. Of course, we, we are a part of the British Commonwealth, but also made of maple leaves and trillions connection to Canada and Ontario. Surmounted by the atomic symbol, a lot of people are curious about that. Well, Mississauga was home to a first in Canada, which was an atomic research center. Sheridan Park Research Center was, was uh, something to marvel at at one point in time in, in terms of Mississauga's identity. Uh, and that symbol finds its way into our coat of arms. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see a British officer holding a scroll in his hand. And on the right-hand side, an, an Indigenous warrior holding four feathers. The British officer in his hand is holding that agreement that was signed, the provisional agreement uh, on August 2nd of 1805, known as Treaty 13A. Um, and it was signed by four Indigenous chiefs, um, and they're represented by the four feathers uh, in the Indigenous warrior's hand. Uh, those two, uh, four chiefs, uh, Chechok, uh, or Chichok, uh, Okamapanes, um, uh, Wabakinin, and uh, um, and Quinnipenon are the four chiefs that are represented in, uh, throughout our city. Um, uh, three of the four of those chiefs are recognized on the landscape in some fashion. Uh, Quinnipenon uh, Meadows Community Park um, and uh, Lake Wabakane and Wabakane Creek are, are two of them. And uh, Oka, uh, Oka Road uh, is a uh, contraction of Oka Mapanes, another chief. Only Chichok, uh, for one reason or another, or for no real reason, I guess, uh, uh, is not yet commemorated on our, our landscape. Um, and those uh, two individuals as well, the shield, are balanced uh, on uh, three lines of water. Uh, they represent the Credit River, the Etobicoke Creek, and Lake Ontario. And of course, our official motto, pride in our past, faith in our future. And that's in, in indeed the, the story of the coat of arms in the city of Mississauga. We have a song uh, for those of you who want to have a, have a fun time looking at it is on YouTube. You'll find the Mississauga song by Tommy Hunter. Um, and Tommy's in the middle there on the stool and just behind him you'll see Councillor Hazel McCallion in the purple dress. And then just beside her in the gray suit you'll find a Mayor Martin Dobkin, the first mayor of the city of Mississauga. Um, November 10th, 1979, uh, a moment in time that uh, really defined the, the generation, defined the uh, maybe our biggest chapter, a single chapter in the story of Mississauga is the train derailment. Um, and we can certainly spend a lot more time on this in the future and the subject of multiple uh, exhibits and publications over time. Um, the largest peacetime evacuation in North American history to that date only surpassed by the evacuation of, of uh, Hurricane uh, Katrina in New Orleans, um, but uh, taking place on uh, November 10th of 1979, over 240,000 people evacuated within the city of Mississauga when CP train 54 carrying a highly explosive chemical load derailed the level crossing at Mavis Road just north of Dundas Street. Um, and uh, the uh, 
emergency lasted for, for almost a week. Um, just an amazing story of uh, a young city and its population and its emergency response being literally tested by fire. Um, we look at the mayors of the city of Mississauga. Um, there is a generation of, of Mississaugans that uh, largely knew only one mayor. Um, Hazel was not the first nor the last mayor, but certainly uh, no one will argue a very significant uh, story or person within the, the story of the city of Mississauga. Our first mayor uh, um, following the creation of the city in 1974 was Dr. Martin Dobkin, followed by Ron Searle followed by Hazel McCallion, and of course now by Mayor Bonnie Crombie. Um, a long history with the individuals who have helped shape and lead the city, uh, both in the past and into, into in the present and into the future. Um, we, you, a lot of people are fascinated with the life and times of Mayor Hazel McCallion. Um, uh, Mayor of Streetsville from 70 to 73, elected uh, then councillor in the city of Mississauga, elected mayor of Mississauga in 1978. She was elected 13 consecutive terms with an average of 92% of the popular vote, uh, claimed three times. Just a remarkable individual, remarkable career, and very impactful on the identity and the story of the city of Mississauga. Um, the subject really to three books, and uh, I, I'd encourage uh, a review or uh, perusing all three, uh, one of which might be a little harder to find than others, but uh, uh, the official biography known as Her known Her Hurricane Hazel, uh, Life and Times of Hazel McCallion, uh, and then by Tom Urbaniak uh, looking at um, the development of Mississauga under the time of Hazel McCallion, uh, the title of the book is Her Worship, and then a more satirical look at uh, the, the evolution of the story of Mississauga by Benjamin Fortin called The Ideal Candidate, and I uh, encourage uh, uh, interaction with all three of them as a, as a fascinating look at the evolution of the city of Mississauga, particularly under the, the times of Hazel McCallion. Uh, a modern city. Um, Mississauga has grown astronomically. In uh, uh, 1959, uh, we had just under 60,000 people living here, and we flash forward, you know, just 70 years later, and we're uh, just under 760,000 people. It's, it's uh, you know, we've grown 700,000 more people in about 70 years. There was a period of time when the rate of our growth in the, in the late 90s was second to none in North America. We, we were just uh, bursting at the seams, it would seem. Like, well, we are Canada's sixth largest city, uh, and we haven't stopped growing. Uh, we, we will continue to grow, and uh, we must as well. And uh, we are you know, a dynamic city with uh, incredible cultures and incredible uh, expression on the landscape. Uh, I always say, if, uh, you know, Mississauga's voice evolves. Um, the Mississauga that my parents knew, uh, Mississauga that I know growing, I knew growing up and know today is going to be vastly, is vastly different than the one that my children will inherit and their children will inherit. And uh, it's a fascinating thing to see grow and percolate and interchange and how all of these voices will, will connect and uh, you know, something that is a, a singularly identifiable as a Mississauga voice and Mississauga culture will uh, in time emerge from that. But in the meantime, we're home to such an incredible array of dynamic cultures. You can uh, see them in, in, and interact with them at events like Kurosaga, but you know, there's, there's so many events on years other than uh, than uh, than COVID years that take place in you know, Celebration Square and elsewhere in our city that just connect to these amazing moments in time in, in our city and uh, I encourage you to check out uh, something known as the Culture Guide or the Heritage Guide and look at our, our city in, in that kind of culture lens as well. Home to, you know, countless languages, countless cultures, uh, all make this place home, all contribute to the story of this place and uh, um, it's amazing to see, amazing to interact with and such a special place to to, uh, to connect with not only in terms of our history, but also in where we're going as well. It's just an amazing thing. Um, we celebrate our legends, the stories of people that help shape this place in a variety of ways. We have something known as Legends Row. Uh, there's the uh, Walk of Fame, Music Walk of Fame down in Port Credit as well. But uh, Legends Row at, uh, at Celebration Square is a, a fascinating way uh, to connect to um, the story of, of this place and the people that helped to shape it. Uh, people from um, uh, just countless individuals. So I encourage you to go check out Legends Row at Celebration Square at uh, at, uh, the, at the Mississauga Civic Center and just uh, um, uh, wander down the, the life and times of those that really truly uh, shaped this place and continue to shape this place uh, in a positive light uh, in terms of uh, the story of, of Mississauga. People to certainly celebrate and, 
uh, and who have uh, spent a great deal of their time championing this place uh, and contributing to the ever-evolving story of, of Mississauga. And we encourage you to explore, um, really, really uh, um, have fun with the, the self-exploration of this place. Again, there are walking tour brochures, but there's countless publications. This is just a smattering of them that you can find, whether you explore lost villages or indigenous history or ghost stories, if you will. Uh, kind of the landmark publication of the, the you know, quote unquote coffee table book is called Mississauga, the first 10,000 years. Um, local authors like Dave Cook and others have produced, uh, again, there's countless uh, publications on the city of Mississauga. When the uh, library opens up and Heritage Mississauga reopens up, a lot of these books are available still for uh, for borrowing and for purchase. And um, some of the newest ones, the, the Heritage Guide in, in 2010, and then just this year, the Cultural Heritage Guide produced by Heritage Mississauga, just different ways and fascinating elements of exploring our landscape and uh, uh, the people in place there. And again, people shape the land and the land has shaped the people and that interrelationship, that, uh, that evolving story never ends. That, uh, and uh, um, so, you know, the story continues and the story continues to grow and gather steam and gather, gather, gather more stories. And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the, the connection to this place. And so thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, again, a whirlwind tour, a kind of chronological journey through Mississauga, of uh, the things that shape this place and uh, continue to shape this place. And uh, uh, I hope you have fun uh, exploring and, uh, and, and learning about Mississauga and uh, connecting and developing that sense of rootedness to this place that we all call home and love greatly. So Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us and uh, happy, happy sleuthing in local history.